Okay, people, I'm back, and this is Riding Into History. As promised when I did the previous video on Jamonville Glen, one of the things that Washington had to do was to go and make a necessary fort for defense, which they've now called Fort Necessity. And I promised on a previous video that I would film that and come here. So here we are. And I'm just going to get the bike started and we'll go into the parking lot and I'll get back with you. All right, I'm back and I have made it to the parking lot. Here is the Fury. That is the visitor center. Quick glimpse of the parking lot, just a few hundred yards from the road where I just last did my last segment. So let's go in and see what we can find and then we'll walk the grounds. Okay, approaching the door, there's a sign here that says visitor center and then that way is the trail to the fort. But let's go in and see what we can see first. Okay, here's one of the exhibits as it would have been at the time of the fort with the British soldiers inside and the French outside in the forest and the ramparts and let's go to the next section Here's the welcome sign. it says in 1754 George Washington suffered the first defeat of his military career and the battle was the prelude to a war that eventually set the stage for the American Revolution. And it says during the 1800s, the United States federally funded highway passed only a few hundred yards from here. The new route, which is Route 40, will link the Atlantic coast to the Ohio River Valley and help make the country's westward expansion possible. George Washington and a statue of him. One of the aspects here that you can see, and it's saying, I did not let the anniversary of Fort Necessity battle pass without a grateful remembrance of our escape. The same providence that protected us will, I hope, continue his mercies and make us happy instruments in restoring peace and liberty. And it says, almost 30 years after he faced combat at Fort Necessity, George Washington returned to this site. His experiences here and in the French and Indian War defined his life. Washington often revisited his own memories about what took place at Fort Necessity. And here it says, Daybreak at May 20, 1754. After slogging all night through a dense rain-soaked forest, George Washington, his Indian guides, and 33 fellow British colonial fighters arrive at a narrow glen miles from Fort Necessity. There, 35 French soldiers are rising from their camp. The two sides are not at war, but a battle is about to begin. <clears throat> and that is on the previous video that I had done. And if you can hear in the background, they are doing a video which I'll try to make it in for the next showing. Here's a, another uh, uh, British officer. Here, these are some of the things that you can read about. Oh, uh, this is Tanagdus Harrison, the Iroquois Viceroy, or the Half King. And that's what I was mentioning on the <clears throat> Jamonvo Glen video. Okay, it's good to put a face with the name. These are some actual artifacts that you can see that were found, and they're on display here for you to see. A lot of trade coming through the area between the whites and the Indians. And this right here is called the Governor Denny Belt. It's a reproduction of a wampum belt composed of the new wampum beads 
It's an invitation from the Pennsylvania Governor Denny asking the Shawnee and the Delaware of Ohio to attend a Peace and Alliance Council in 1758. This is a war belt. It's another reproduction. And it was circulated around the Ohio country during the 1700s. These belts were passed among the Indians to announce the coming of war. <clears throat> the belt is made with original red and blue glass trade beads that are 250 to 300 years old. The shell beads seen in the white hatchet are new wampum. Okay, this last one here is a Johnson dish belt. It says this belt made of new wampum beads is a reproduction of the ones commissioned by British Indian agent Sir William Johnson. He had it presented to several Indian nations during the mid 1750s in hopes of gaining their allegiance. Here we can see early tools that a doctor or surgeon would use. And as you can see there's a jar there labeled with leeches. And they believed that when you had an illness, you had an imbalance of the blood, and they would often bleed you with leeches to drain blood from your body as an attempt to cure. And from what I've gathered from the book I've read on General Washington, that's how he died. And when he went out for his ride, he became ill, and they bled him with leeches, which further weakened him and led to his final demise. Here are some muskets from the area. It says 69 caliber French inf infantry muskets. Those are awesome. Okay. Here we see some clothing that would have been worn by the French along with a piece of a hatchet, a powder horn, and a bayonet. This is typical of what the American Indians would have had at the time. And this is what the British would have worn. I think this room here is an awesome little room. If you look to the left, it has all of the British outside of Fort Necessity with some timbers. And on this side, you have the French in the woods. So as you step in this little round rotunda room, kind of gives you a feeling of being in there, being inside the at the time of the battle. Now I believe these wooden ones here are reproductions. But these here that are encased, there is a glare, let me see. These wooden posts here, it says, I believe these are the actual original posts when they excavated around the fort. And these were taken out because the French had burned the fort. It says on July 4th, 1754, victorious French troops pulled up most of the Fort Necessity's white oak posts and piled them against what was left of a stockade. They then lit it all on fire, buried below ground these posts and survived the blaze and were unearthed by archaeologist J.C. Harrington almost 200 years later. This one here talks about Braddock's campaign. It says less than a year after the Battle of Fort Necessity, Great Britain returned to the French, or the, excuse me, the forks of the Ohio, only to face disaster. And this is uh, going back to the other video that I had posted. So basically, there was Jamon Vogelin, which Washington stirred up a hornet's nest, came here to Fort Necessity, was defeated, released. Then a year later, General Braddock came to reclaim the area, but was mortally wounded and is buried where he is currently at, where I had showed you on the previous film. This one here, it's a little uh, dimly lit here, but this one here is talking about war for an empire. Again, going back to how the British wanted to control all of the Americas and the French were also trying to claim it as well. 
which the two superpowers at the time had come together and as I said earlier it's going from Jamonville Glen to Fort Necessity to Braddock's demise and then the conflict the tension just kept rising and rising and as you can see from these uh, posters here how it just started into the French and Indian War or the Seven Years War which not just stemmed in in the eastern side of the United States is, is the last as this one here shows but on this one how it's, it's also spread to Europe even to Africa all the way to Asia and then it did finally at the end of the price of peace it says Great Britain and Fan France finally declared peace on February 10th 1763 with the Treaty of Paris but it says unlike the previous wars over the past century they had ended in a stalemate and it this war produced a clear winner with the British earning a decisive victory France lost both North America and India Great Britain won control of a sprawling new and costly empire no group however lost more than the American Indian nations a major political power before the war American Indians found themselves nearly powerless after the war ended tribes that fought against the British faced harsh reprisals those who had fought with the British soon found their land overrun by colonial settlers and despite Indian resistance conditions only worsened in the years that followed I'm gonna try to spin around without giving you some whirlies too, spinning too quickly but it kind of gives you the history and little plexiglass placards all the way through and I'm going backwards sorry should have started here 1754 Fort Necessity 1755 Braddock's defeat and then as you can see the war of 1756 57 Fort William Henry massacre 1758 was peace 1760 Montreal surrenders Ooh, sorry about that it cut out uh, but it says the war ends uh, Pontiac's rebellion taxing the colonies Lexington and Concord and on to the Declaration of Independence which begins a whole new chapter in American history That looks like where all where the war had reached to all these areas of the world. And this one here says the road to revolution. And it's pretty much just going back through what I had just said about how it's gone from Jamonville Glen all the way to the Declaration of Independence. This is where, because they're in the early days of America, traveling west was no easy chore. And he and George Washington wanted to have a more stable road for the settlers to travel west. It says, for years, the Appalachian Mountains pinned Americans in along the Atlantic coast. So the um, one of the 1775 travelers called Braddock's Road, a route to the Ohio country left over from the French and Indian War, it was riddled with tree stumps rising over steep grades and frequently washed out by rains. But that was the only road at the time. So then in 1784, George Washington journeyed the tedious road to inspect the western Pennsylvania land holdings. Appalled by the experience, he called for a new road that would open a, a wide door and make a smooth way between America's Atlantic coast and its western interior. And that's the birth of the National Roads starting. And this room here is very interesting. We see President Washington with the National Road. And to his left, it shows them working on the National Road, clearing forests. This is Mr. Albert Gallatin, famous in the area. These are the taverns in the 
basically the road stops along the way and this is a the taverns that were along the way where people could um, stop along the way to have a meal and take a break rest their horses and just get out of the wagons for a while just to, basically is what we do today when we're in the vehicles you take a stop every now and again stretch your legs there's mr thomas jefferson president jefferson To his right, it's an engraving of a suspension bridge over the Ohio River. This is James Monroe. This is Henry Clay. And Andrew Jackson. Let's see what this does. In the late 1700s, America's roads were little more than deeply rutted, muddy tracks. Traveling even a few miles could be an adventure, and as the country expanded west, the greatest barrier to settlement was the lack of decent routes through the Allegheny Mountain Range. Many, including George Washington, wanted to build a road through this rugged terrain. The way is plain, and the expense deserves not a thought. So great would be the prize. We should open a wide door and make a smooth way. But not everyone saw the advantage of such a road, and a debate raged over who should pay for it. Just like today, people in one region were reluctant to finance a venture that seemed to only benefit those in another. Even the founding fathers, such as James Monroe, debated whether it should be the states or the federal government that funded projects like the road. My idea is that Congress has an unlimited power to raise money, and that it has power to spend on common defense and on issues of national, but not local, benefit. In 1806, Secretary of the Treasury Albert Gallatin crafted a deal that didn't settle the debate, but at least offered a compromise. Under Gallatin's plan, the federal government would pay for the road, not with taxes, however, but from the proceeds of land sales in Ohio. The nation must devote its financial resources to cement the bonds of the Union. Starting in Cumberland, Maryland in 1811, crews began to carve out and lay down America's first federally funded road. By 1818, they reached Wheeling on the banks of the Ohio River at a cost of $13,000 per mile. Some, such as Thomas Jefferson, wanted the road, but voiced a familiar concern that it could become a pork barrel project. I view it as a source of boundless patronage, a bottomless abyss of public money. It will be the scene of eternal scramble among the members of Congress who can get the most money wasted in their state. But to Henry Clay and many other advocates, the national road might pass through just a few states, but it would benefit the entire country. The most stupid are sensible of the benefit of a good road. We should look at the whole system when we contemplate a nation. The decision involves the future destiny of this growing country. The road pushed on into Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Covering over 500 miles, it cost just under $8 million. As construction and maintenance costs mounted, the debate over local versus federal responsibility flared up again. President Andrew Jackson was firmly in favor of handing the road over to the states. Government's true strength consists in leaving individuals and states as much as possible to themselves. The destruction of our state government's control over local concerns would lead directly to despotism. But many of the states didn't want to take on the financial burden. Gradually, the federal government turned the road over to the states, and to pay for its upkeep, they built toll houses. By 1840, the road bustled with activity. More than 200,000 people traveled the national road each year in its heyday, with thousands of wagons passing along every day. The national road was the artery through which the lifeblood of America road that America built, and it became the road that made America. 
Mm, that was a very interesting. Let's see what else we can see. These are some of the tools of the trade, as it were. Oxen yoke. This is what was used in building the road. And what spurred the westward expansion of America. This is an interesting thing I've seen here. It says in 1854, this cornerstone commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Fort Necessity, that local masons placed this cornerstone time capsule filled with local newspapers, historic documents, a commemorative coin, and a picture of George Washington on the Great Meadows. Further construction on a larger monument never progressed because of lack of funds. And this is some of the names. It says within this battle site are buried and these, the, all these names of these soldiers and 17 others whose names are known only to God. And this tells about the some more of the history that's going on here. This is what J.C. Harrington found in his 1953 dig at Fort Necessity. Some papers, documents, correspondence. And of course, we're going to have to get a souvenir. Now let's go out to the fort and see what we can find.